The most important thing I would say is first of all, know your blood pressure stat. Whatever you do, know your blood pressure stat. And welcome to another episode of your Health Matters podcast by Sorogi. I am your host, Vivian Nacho Ayok, pharmacist and certified diabetes care and education specialist. It's always a pleasure doing this show because we get to learn so much. And I'm hoping that this information inspires you, gets you healthy and living your best possible life. Today, we're going to be talking about something that's really important and has affected so many of us, family, friends. Hypertension is also known as the silent killer. And despite our best efforts, it still continues to be the number one cause of cardiovascular disease and death in the whole world, not just us in the United States. And I think if we are honest with ourselves, there's so many stories we know, friends, family, who have actually been affected by this health condition. So to learn more about this and what we can do as a community to improve health outcomes, increase awareness, is Dr. Ike Chuko Mwosu. Dr. Ike is no stranger to this show. He's one of our most popular guests. I am super happy to have him come on so we can talk about hypertension today. Dr. Ike, welcome to your Health Matters podcast. Hello, good evening, Vivian. Um, thank you for having me again to the show. I'm happy to be here. Um, thank you for our viewers, and I hope you guys are going to enjoy today's episode. Awesome. It's going to be a good one. And just a little background on Dr. Ike. Dr. Ike is a family nurse practitioner out in Washington, D.C. He's been on the show before. Today, we want to talk about something that is so common in our community, hypertension. So, Dr. I, how do you really begin to explain to patients at the health center what is hypertension, especially when they are newly diagnosed? How do you approach it and what is usually their reaction? Now, when I meet a patient or how a patient is diagnosed with hypertension, most people might not know what hypertension is. So we, we tell them it means another word for it is high blood pressure, meaning your blood pressure is high. and Somebody might say, oh, why do you mean my blood pressure is high? So in our body, we need our blood to go all over our body to supply oxygen to help our body to function. And all this starts with the heart that pumps the blood through the blood vessels and the arteries. Now, it requires a certain number of pressure to perform this job effectively. Uh, when this pressure is higher than it's supposed to, then that's what we call hypertension or high blood pressure. Now, the question is, what where is the level where you say this is high? For the American College of Cardiology Association, uh, hypertension is classified in two steps. When the blood pressure, which is the systolic blood pressure, which is also known as the top number when you're reading your blood pressure, um, that's when the heart is contracting to pump the blood out to the body. And when the number is above 130 to 139, and the diastolic blood pressure, which is the bottom number, as we tell our patients, which is also when the heart is relaxing after it pumps our blood, is 80 to 89. That is stage one hypertension or stage one high blood pressure. Now, when it is above 140, the top number is above 140, or the bottom number is above 90. That is stage two. Now, this also differs with the European Cardiology Association, um, the classification as hypertension is when the blood pressure is 140 over 90 or above. So basically, um, when that pressure is that high, then we will say somebody has high blood pressure or hypertension. So blood pressure is a good thing, right? It's where when the pressure is elevated be above that target number, it's when it becomes an issue is what I'm hearing you say. Exactly, exactly. Oh. We, we, need, oh, we all need a blood pressure in our system to live, to function. 
if there's no blood pressure, our will be dead. Basically, is when it's a higher at a certain number, past a certain target, then that's where it becomes a problem to us. Why is that a big problem when we have blood pressure above at the target and have it for a long period of time? Right. So what has happened is if that becomes above number uh, above the number we you know want it to be, um, it becomes in a negative impact on the other organs of the body. First of all, when the blood pressure is high, the arteries or where the blood flows through, which is the vascular system, it puts pressure on that. When it puts pressure on that, um, it becomes a situation where the artery can bust or in a layman language, um, break. And that's another problem. Um, it can be a problem where there is a, a decreased supply to the organs, to the brain of blood or to the heart, um, to the kidney. So that could lead to kidney failure. It can lead to stroke. It can lead to heart attack. Now, what are some of the risk factors now um, for developing hypertension or high blood pressure? Yeah, as for the risk factors, they're, they're what we call the things you can control and the things you cannot control. Now, for the, one of the risk factors, the things we cannot control is your age, right? The uh, older you get, the risk of you getting high blood pressure increases. Um, and that thing is your race. You cannot control that. Now, it is found that Af- African-American or Blacks have higher incidence of high blood pressure. Please continue with all the other uh, risk factors, especially the ones we have no control over. Right. So, yeah, the age and the ethnicity, those are the things that we cannot control. Now, we have the things that we can control. And one of the risk factors is obesity. The more weight we gain or the more overweight we are, that also increases the chance of getting high blood pressure. Not being physically active, which is lack of exercise, that also increases the risk of getting high blood pressure. And that thing is salt intake. Our rate of salt intake um, increases the chance of, of getting hypertension because salt contains a lot of sodium and sodium in the body makes us to retain water. And while we're retaining water, that increases the blood pressure in the body. Also, too much alcohol is another risk factor that causes us to increase and high blood pressure risk. Of course, high cholesterol intake. That is another risk factor that we can change that increases the risk of hypertension. Of course, cutting down on alcohol, that will also help. What are some of the things that we actually have control over when it has to do with our risk for um, high blood pressure. Right. So one is, is, is physical activity or exercise. Most of us engage in a sedentary lifestyle where um, the kind of work we do, we're sitting in the office eight hours a day. Um, before getting into the office, we're driving through our car to get into the office. We leave the car, we get into the job, we sit in the job. Uh, we barely get time for lunch. Even when we get time for lunch, we're sitting to eat the food. Um, you come home, you're sitting again in your couch and watching TV. So you basically do not get any exercise or any physical activity in your life. Now it's recommended that we should get at least 30 minutes of exercise a day in five days, or a total of 150 minutes of exercise or physical activity in a week. And now when we mention exercise, people panic. Right? People are like, oh, I don't have time to go to the, you know, the kind of work that I do, I can't go to the gym which is fine, but you don't need the gym to get a physical activity. Just by brisk walking, that helps you to get your exercise in. And by taking the stairs, instead of taking the elevator or lift, as they call it in the other parts of the world, get you your physical activity. Um, during your lunch time, or you could just take a walk around the neighborhood or around your office, wherever have you. That will help you to get your physical activity. So you don't necessarily have to go to the gym to lift weight like me to be able to get your physical activity in. There are other things you can do around you. Um, so you, you want to cut down on the salt intake. And of course, we talked about the alcohol as the things you can change. Um, avoid alcohol. If you're a man, one drink a day is and not one to two drinks enough for you. For a woman, only one drink a day is, is good enough for you. Uh, I just one more risk factors I wanted to ask about. What about smoking? Yes. So glad you mentioned that smoking is a very, very important risk factor. I know some of us know somebody or ourselves who's somebody near us or even depressed somebody watching this today um, who smokes cigarettes. Smoking is a big, big risk factor in terms of 
getting hypertension. I always explain to patients when you smoke, there are so many things that goes in the body. One of them is the constriction of the blood vessels. So when it constricts blood vessels, what happens is also brings back the analogy of my water hose. If you constrict the blood vessels, it makes it difficult for blood to flow through the vessels as it's supposed to, thereby increases that blood pressure to go through. Um, so by cutting that smoking, you also help to cut down your risk of hypertension. And if you quit uh, completely, that also decreases your blood pressure risk in a very significant amount. That, that's a good point you bring there. A lot of time when I talk to people who smoke, it's still like, yeah, I get it. It's not the best thing for me, but it helps a lot with stress. And you're like, well, stress is supposed to be bad for my blood pressure. Right. I always tell patients, you thinking that smoking helps you to release stress, it does not. Uh, but smoking is doing more harm than good. Of course, we know all that risk. Um, factors of smoking uh, where it can cause lung cancer and stroke and uh, throat cancer, which we're not getting into at this point. But like I explained earlier, smoking and resisting stress does not help you in any way. So no, smoking does not reduce stress. Neither does it help in, help you in any way or shape in the body. So bottom line, Smoking has really no health benefits. No, it doesn't. It doesn't have any health benefits. And even all that stimulant too, like some people might take cocaine or a lot of caffeine, that also impact, negatively impacts your blood pressure and causes the blood pressure to go high. Because all these things, all they do is to constrict the blood vessels. And when they constrict the blood vessels, blood flow decreases. And the heart, what it does is wants to get that blood everywhere in the body. So by any means necessary. So it will keep force her to keep working harder to push that blood through. And so that is why it's important to control the things you can control in terms of these risk factors. We've talked about the risk factors. We talk about factors that we have control over and things we don't have control over, such as age, ethnicity, and things like that. I want to talk about something else that I think is pretty common in our community. And that's the relationship between wealth and chronic health conditions like hypertension. Time we make it there, whether you're here or back in any country in the world, you make it big and all of a sudden you now have maybe two cars, three cars, right? You have a driver that or a chauffeur that carries you around, right? Now there is that reduced physical activity that is a status thing, right? You've made it. Why should you have to walk to the bus stop? The whole point of working hard was to get to this point so you can enjoy all these things in life. And then you get there and then someone like you and I come along, Dr. Ike will say, hey, I need you to walk more. It's like, are you kidding me? How is that all of a sudden a bad thing? Right. And and that comes to the sedentary lifestyle that I was talking about earlier. And like you said, we've achieved this. We now have that car. You want to show up that fancy car. So if you're trying to go run to the grocery store, you hop into that car. You know, if you're trying to go to church, you hop into that car. Anyway, you want to go, you hop into the car. Um, but that doesn't help you, like I said. And being uh, achieving that wealth means you have to be in the office to work. And some of us have job where you can't even walk from one place to another. Like I tell people, like for us as provider, healthcare providers, when we're in the clinic, at least we're mobile. You know, we're not sitting in one place. Yes. We're going from the office to the patient's room, from one patient room to another, at least we're moving around. But for somebody who is an executive office or any kind of job where you need to sit, it makes sense that when you come out of the office, find a way to walk. And like I said, when you're taking your lunch break, instead of not trying to have a car to go to your lunch, take a walk. Walk to the lunch place that you're going to go eat. If you someone who eats in the clean in the office, you bring your own lunch to work. When you eat your lunch, take a walk, or even take your lunch to walk around. If you if there's a park nearby, or take it to walk to that park to eat. Or after you eat, take a walk around the office. If you are home, take a walk to the grocery store. I know some people the grocery store is far away from the office. What I tell people is that sometimes when you park in the grocery store, park far away, when you get to the parking lot, park far away from the you know, entrance and walk to the place. 
all those things they add up for you. When you get to the office or you go to a place, instead of taking the elevator, take the stairs. You know, it's a challenge. For example, for me, I tell my patient, I practice what I preach. And in the office, people know that I'm that person who don't take the elevator. I really do take the elevator, whether going up or going down. It's all part of me getting my physical activities in. Right, you have to factor all those things. Yes, the car will be there. You're always going to use the car, uh, but it doesn't make you less of a person if you walk. You're getting your activities around. I know people now use Fitbit to track uh, their daily walks. You can do that. And if you haven't achieved your daily amount of work or exercise, you got to find a way to keep it going. That's what I have to say on that part. No, that's good. I really like that. And I'll share a story with you that my mom told me about a few years ago. And she's a very prayerful woman, and I love her, love her. She covers all of us in prayers all the time. And she shared a story with me that there was a time when a lot of young men, they were making it, they just got newly married. So they were in their early or mid-40s. So it's like they've worked so hard in all this different position, they finally made it, everything every family wanted, right? And then all of a sudden, one by one, they're just dropping dead. Right around mid 40s or early 50s, they don't make it long enough. And she's like, you know, Adachi, please join us in prayer. We have a universal prayer because all our young men are dying. And I was thinking when she was saying this, I'm like, hmm, what's the family history there, right? Hypertension. Right, right. So I'm, <laughs> I'm sure you're familiar with those stories. You probably right. have them too. I, yeah, I'm very, very familiar with that. You know, you know when, and you know, when that starts happening, or the, you hear the things that, oh, he became successful, and one of the uncles or one of the aunties is not happy, they've taken him out. They killed him. They casted a spell on him. Now, this is an important stack that I need to share. People may know how serious hypertension is. It is by the World Health Organization, it is estimated that 1.2 billion adults, 1.2 billion, let that sink in, 1.28 billion adults aged 30 to 79 years old worldwide have hypertension. I don't know if that number... Let, let's say that again. Let, let's say right. that again one more right. time. Repeat that stat again for our audience. Exactly. By the World Health Organization, it is estimated that 1.28 billion adults aged 30 to 79 years old worldwide have hypertension, right? And just to let you know how alarming this is, it is also estimated that about 46% of these adults with hypertension do not know that they have hypertension. So wow. that comes to the story you're telling. And then it gets worse. Less than half of this adult, 42% of them with hypertension are diagnosed and treated. So you see how it is. 46 do not know they have it, but only 42 are being diagnosed and being treated. Right? So that's how long it is. Now, hypertension is a major cause of premature death worldwide. So that comes to what we're saying. You know, you achieve this status, you don't you know, get your checkup done, then your blood pressure is high, and one day, boom, somebody drops it. And like, remember at the beginning, I said hypertension is a silent killer, right? Awesome. People You're right. Check. You're right. You know, I'm living the life. I don't feel anything. And I get this every day. When I tell patients, oh, you have high blood pressure, you have hypertension. And of course, we don't diagnose them on the first time. But when you finally tell them you have high blood pressure, you have hypertension, you say, but oh, I don't, I don't feel anything. Yes, you're not going to feel anything. That's why it's called a silent killer. And as a matter of fact, when you start feeling things, then it started doing some damages in your organ, your kidney, your heart, you know. So that is why everybody needs to be aware of their blood pressure. And like you said, the story you just told about your mom calling your prayers. Yes, prayers are good. Our moms pray for us all the time. But if you don't know the root cause of the things that are happening in your life, this will keep happening. And then you're blaming the wrong person. Your family will be blaming the wrong person. Then there's more stress coming into our life because we're fighting fight that is not really the issue of our problem. Why the main problem is they're silently killing us one by one when we're supposed to be enjoying the fruits of our labor. And this happens to millions and millions of people across the world, you know. 
dragon. And I tell people, stroke, heart attack, is not only for the older age. It can be 30, it can be 40, and it happened to you. You can be living your best life, and that will happen to you. All because you didn't take the time to check your body, to meet your primary care provider, to monitor yourself for this blood pressure. Making these little changes that we talked about earlier will go a long way in saving your life. I mean, you've heard about the stat, 1.2 billion people. And 46% of these people don't even know that they have hypertension. So imagine what can happen with this 46% of people in the long run. So let that sink in. I really hope everyone who's listening, this a wake up call and everyone will get your blood pressure check, right? Go to local clinic by you, visit your doctor annually, get that blood pressure check. And if you need to take medications, make those lifestyle changes, um, that we really take it serious because we cannot rely on our body always letting us know when things are wrong, right? Because by the time you to feel it, any signs or symptoms, it might be too late. You could actually be experiencing a heart attack or a stroke. But regular checkup, having a blood pressure kit at home, you mentioned that that was really good information, can be very helpful. Um, another thing, again, I wanted us to talk about, again, has to do with food. A lot of time people feel like there's nothing wrong with the way we eat. Our parents, our great-grandparents have been eating this way. Why change now? And I bring it up because you talk about the salt and increased saturated fat. And a lot of time, again, status. We're flexing when we start having a little bit of money, right? You want to have three different types of meat in your soup. Well, it's not good enough to just have a small slice of meat like it used to be now. If you're making it, there need to be at least two layers of oil between that and the real soup. <laughs> and then there should be all types of meat. But... That's not necessarily the best thing for us, is it? No, it's not. Def definitely not. I look at, they will say chop life. In, in Nigeria, we say chop life before life chop you. Uh, in the layman, enjoy your life before you know, the life will turn around and kill you. I understand that we make the money we need to enjoy. We will only live once. In this generation, we we'll call it YOLO. You only live once. But it's all about taking things in moderation. Just because... You know, you grew up not enjoying meat, not enjoying all these special delicacies. Doesn't mean when you're able to afford it, you should go all in out and try to get everything all in one day. You could space your diet. Uh, because what happens with all those meats that you're eating, you know, all that three different sizes and shapes of food that you're eating, all of them are going to be seasoned with salt. Majority of the time. Yep. Majority of the time majority we season with salt. We season with maggi Correct. and all this stuff, right? Correct. Which is and really high time, in sodium. all add up. Yes, it might not taste the saltiness because people think that it's only when you taste the saltiness means you're eating high salt intake food. Not really. Like I said, if you're dealing with high blood pressure, one of the ways to control or even prevent high blood pressure is to limit your sodium intake to less than two, two grams per day. But imagine all that food that you're eating every day. It's like seasoned food, the meat in the morning, in the night. In the, you know, you have all types of meals on your plate. When the add up, it's going to be definitely greater than two grams of sodium in a day. So that's why it is important to mix it up. Sometimes it'll be your vegetables, maybe your fruits, your salad. Those are the things where... and. Now, just because you're eating salad doesn't mean you're eating healthy because I've seen people who have that salad and they say sprinkle a lot of salt in there. So this is how my grandma used to make it. It's, it makes it delicious. It, that defeats the purpose. But uh, balancing your meals with vegetables and fruit goes a long way. And not every time meat, meat. Eating meat, it doesn't show your well status. I'm not saying you shouldn't eat meat, but it is in moderation. I remember giving a presentation in Texas once about the importance of reducing saturated fat in our diet, cutting back on salt. And I was told that there was a huge argument in the male's bathroom asking who invited that lady to come. <laughs> now our wives are going to start cooking <laughs> different. My goosey soup, my <laughs> offense salad, you know, that's the little joy I have in life. One of the few things that are still left. Now she's going to have them change the way they cook. 
And it was back and forth. It was real serious acumen about how I'm going to come change things for the worse. <laughs> and I cannot believe it. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, it was a serious acumen. The pros and cons of making changes, small changes to the way we do things to improve our overall health. Um, but I like, I like what you're sharing um, so far. Another one too, again, has to do with weight. Obesity, it's really becoming a big chronic health uh, challenge um, in our communities. And that has impact as well, right? In our right. risk for developing high blood pressure. So again, it goes against what beliefs are, our culture is, and for me, what we all aspire to, like, that's how you show you got money. You can't be skinny and say right. you got money, you know? So <laughs> Again, yeah, again, it's like, how do we begin to change that narrative that, you know, just because you're making it now doesn't mean that your weight has to go up. Like the, your bank account cannot be measured by how heavy by your you weight. are. Right. And, and that's something from the community we come from, especially for the men. When the belly is big, like this person is chopping money. He has money. Uh, talking about measuring your wealth or your status with your weight is... I went home for Christmas, you know, one of my aunties was like, Ike, what is wrong? You look skinny. Are you okay? Are you eating at all? Like she was worried. You could see the, you know, the anxiety in her face. Like, what's no, I said, auntie, calm down. I exercise. I play soccer. You know, auntie, you don't have to gain weight to look good or to show that your something is good. I say, I actually have to lose, like, as I am, I want to lose more weight. So why, but why is that? People think you're sick. I said, no, auntie, it's for my own health. You know? So like you said, people should know that it's not when you gain weight. You could, you could look physically healthy, you know, by eating healthy, cutting down on those junk food, fatty food. And like you said, when we get money, sometimes we don't even eat at home again. We don't even, you know, now that we shop right back home. All this fancy, people want to go there, show that you're eating your ice cream, you're eating this, you're eating that, take a picture of it, have this meal here, have this one here. People go on vacation, uh, they take a video of this meal that they order, they're like, yes, I'm living life, I'm on vacation. But what happens on the long run increases that obesity risk. The obesity risk in turn increases your risk for high cholesterol. High cholesterol in turn increases your risk for high blood pressure. Because what happens is that, that plaque build up in your vascular system in the arteries, those fats accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. And what it does then, it increases that blood pressure, a bleed of blood, blood to flow through that vascular system. And that creates a high, high, you know, causes hypertension. And long run, stroke happens, or, you know, or you have heart attack, heart disease, kidney failure, or even death. So I want us now to go into uh, management and end things up with prevention. Yeah, people can be told, finally, hey, I'm aware, I get it, I have hypertension now. They're diagnosed with it, they're put on medications, but the problem is having to take that medication every day, especially for a condition that they were probably were not feeling any symptoms, right? They were not feeling anything. And all of a sudden, you're going to have them start taking a pill or two every day. And I've had people say the medications make them feel worse than <laughs> the hypertension. I it's like, take, for example, the water pill, right? We call diuretics, right? They go to the bathroom a lot and they're like, I was perfectly fine until you told me I have hypertension or high blood pressure, put me on a medication that has me constantly going to the bathroom to pee. How can that be better for me? So help us understand the benefits of taking our blood pressure medication. When we're managing high blood pressure, not everybody gets to be on medication, you know, because that's one of the things that scare people away from coming to the clinic or visiting their primary care to get themselves checked up. Because some people just hate taking medication. So we we'll say, I always say, just because you're diagnosed with hypertension today doesn't mean you're going to be on medication. Now, it varies case by case from person to person. A young person comes in that diagnosed hypertension. We have a heart to heart talk with it. We talk about all the differences that we can make in our life to you know, lifestyle, lifestyle changes we can make and to get that blood pressure normal. Nine out of 10 times or seven out of 10 times, the person is going to adhere to this exercise, try to eat healthy and to try to get it down. So there are some group where that lifestyle changes alone will help to lower the blood pressure and keep them off medication. 
great. Now, the other group where we've tried to add lifestyle changes in a month, three months, nothing has changed. And we see that the blood pressure keeps going up and up. That's when we have to have the honest conversation. Hey, we need to, you know, go medication route. In addition, we should continue your lifestyle changes. But the medication route will help faster to get this blood pressure well controlled. There are different medications. And sometimes some people will do well on just one medication alone. Some people will do well by a combination of medications, uh, depending on how it is. Um, but majority of the things the blood pressure do for our body is that it relaxes the blood vessels. When it relaxes the blood vessels, what it makes it then, it widens it. Once when it's relaxed, it's not contracted, right? And when it's not contracted, so blood flows easily. So that's one of the things that these blood pressure medications do to our body. So when the blood flows easily, it thereby decreases the blood pressure. And I'm talking about the water pill that you talked about. What does it do? It eliminates extra water from the body. By eliminating that extra water from the body, it lowers our blood pressure. Not only that is it eliminating that extra water, why it's doing that, it also eliminates some of those salt intake that we've already accumulated. And so with that, so you're doing to your eliminating salt intake, too much salt in our body, at the same time eliminating the excess water that's causing overload in our vascular system that lowers our blood pressure. So the more they take it every single day, that will help to keep that blood pressure normal. And, you know, case by case basis, we, we look at how well the person is doing that along with lifestyle management. Sometimes we, just because they start medication today, it doesn't mean they're going to take it for the rest of their life. Depending on how well they're doing, there are people we take off the medication and have them focus on the lifestyle management and they will still perform very well on that. But when it can do well on your lifestyle management alone, we help you with the medication. And it's very, very important that when that medication is prescribed, you should take it every day as prescribed, unless otherwise directed by your primary care doctor to say, okay, it's time to, you know, cut down or it's time to take you off from this medication because you're doing well. And some people can manage with um, making changes on nutrition, increasing physical activity, right? How, keeping a healthy weight, reducing stress. And also, uh, you know, we have situations where people were started on medications, they continue to make those changes and how to come off those medications. Correct. Correct. Yeah, exactly. That's like I said, yeah. Um, the more you continue to make that life changes, it gives you a better chance actually to come off those medications, you know. But I always encourage patients, you know, you don't come off unless your provider directs you to come do so. Because abruptly discontinuing some of this medication can shoot up your blood pressure. So that's why, you know, we tell them to keep checking the blood pressure, keeping a record of it. That gives us an idea on when and how to win you off of their medication. We don't just abruptly stop it. So it's always important to communicate whatever side effects you're getting from the medication you're on to your provider so they can make changes as opposed to completely stopping the medicine because you're getting that side effect and you don't communicate. You know, to your next visit, your provider is like, what's going on? Oh, I haven't been taking it because I have been going to the bathroom a lot. You could have communicated that and they would change it before your next visit because they, they don't necessarily have to be in the office or the clinic for your medication to be changed. So that's something where communication becomes important, you know, when you experience any negative side effects from medication that you're on. Now, I like that point you make. I've seen it happen too many times. And I, you know, you're sharing that. And I was thinking about this young lady who was a Metro bus driver and she was only taking her medications on the weekend for blood pressure. And I'm going, what, what's going on here? Uh, and she's like, well, I'm driving the bus during the day. I cannot be stopping to go pee. <laughs> so I'm like, did you tell your doctor that's like, no, I figured when I come back in three, six months, I'll let her know. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not how it's supposed to work. But yeah, same thing. And she was just like, you know what? This is not going to interfere with my job. I am only going to take it on the weekend when I can, and I can afford that time to be going back and forth to the bathroom. So but I said, if she had mentioned it earlier, she probably would have had it change, right? right? And also knowing the kind of job and the impact it was having. There's so many different options. And that goes to also, all the other different side effects of the other medications, right? It's beginning to really affect quality of life. Don't stop on your own. Correct. Definitely share with your healthcare provider. Correct. Right? So let's move on to, that's management. So many different classes of drug can be picked from. What about incorporating stress reducers, like making sure that we're sleeping well and reducing our exposure to stress? What are some of the things that we can do? We talk about stress 
I know there are some stress that, you know, life comes with a lot of stress. We, we get that. You know, there are some things it cannot prevent. But it's always very, very important to take a break in life. Whatever you do, take a break to rest. Take a break from hustle and bustle of life. Some people find good ways of managing stress. You could do that by watching comedy shows. You could do that by sleeping. Sleeping is a major way to release stress. At least getting a maximum of seven to eight hours of sleep a day or a night. I always tell people when managing stress, sometimes you have to look at things you can control and things you cannot control. You know, there are things, distressors in our life that we can't control. And those that you can't control, you have to learn to let it go, right? You do your best, you let it go. I know it's difficult. Everybody has different things in their life that is going on. But if you can't control it, there is no benefit in worrying and worrying and worrying over it. If you need to talk to somebody, if it's a mental health stress, you want to go talk to somebody who is specialized in mental health. Mental health, you know, especially from the community we come from, when you say, oh, I'm going to see a mental health provider, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, they say, oh, this person is a therapist. Crazy. A therapist. So, you know, talk to somebody who is well equipped to listen to you and give you evidence-based guidelines on how to cope with your stress. It is very, 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 very important in our life. And everybody needs a therapist, no matter how big, how small you are. No matter what is going on in your life, even when you don't think you you need it, if you talk to one, you'd be amazed at the things you can unravel, the things you can unpack it. And when you get that off your chest, you would see a big load off you. And that's a, one of the ways you can relieve the stress. And sleep is very important. One of the things is that if you can afford it, get some days, treat yourself to a massage. You'll be amazed to what that helps. And some people say, but I can't afford to pay $150, $100. If you're, in the, if you're watching this and you're in the United States, use your Groupon coupon. Yes, sir. You will be amazed at how much massage goes on on Groupon. You print that coupon, $40. That is, I know, of course, not everybody can afford that. But if you can, it costs it down from being $150 for one hour massage to $40. And you go there and trust me, you get the same quality massage as somebody who paid $150. That goes a long way in relieving stress in your body. Exercise releases stress in your body. You know, yes. you do that exercise. I, I, I don't know, but everybody who does, I will tell you, after they finish the exercise and come home, take their shower and relax, you will see it's like a weight has been lifted up your body. So those are ways of managing your stress. Meditations too. Meditation yeah. helps a lot. A lot of time you meditate, you're able to bring down your stress level and your blood pressure goes down as well. Prayer. Prayer is really key as well for people who do it consistently. They can tell you, what is it we say again, right? What God cannot do does not exist. Yep. Uh-huh. Now you're talking my language now. So prayer, it's something I know is very big in our community. It helps a lot. Prayer groups, our church groups, uh, soccer groups on the weekends, good ways of reducing stress. And and that and talking about that, you know, the group is, is a very good thing. Even here in the States, you know, that's something that's becoming popular in a, in the African community. And I hope every other community can embrace this, you know, physical activity group. Even I myself, I have my own, you know, men group where we, we you know, midweek and weekends, we come in, we play soccer, we relax, we have fun, we talk. And one thing that is in common in that group, everybody always says, this is a place that I come in, I forget my problems in life. Everybody says this all the time. I come to this place, I forget my problems in life. You know, I enjoy having time with my brothers. And then you're right. Even here too, I see so many of the groups and sometimes they've been going on for 10, 15 years. One more thing. Well, we're still talking about physical activity. I see that in our community is more common with the men. Men seem to have this kind of groups. Sometimes even more better, I see people in multiple soccer groups, right? Are you guys have to come teach us something? Because us, the ladies, I don't know. We do so many things good. But this one, when it comes to physical activity, I don't think we're doing well. <laughs> we're doing so well. We need to come learn. We need to come find out what you guys are doing. 
So we can also begin to do it too. Because I don't know if women exercise groups, especially around soccer or anything for that. That's been going on as long as I've seen some of the soccer groups, men's soccer groups in the area. Now, one of the things that I recommend or I've seen for women is the yoga groups. Yoga is a good way. Yoga. Yeah. You have come again. Yoga is a good way to relieve stress. And I see some women are very interested in this, you know. Now, yeah. You might say that some yoga classes might be expensive, and that is where it comes in, where people can form their own group at home, right? You yeah. can even share where you can interchange your homes to share among your group, or go to the local community areas or field, you know, to do. I see that sometimes even when in my soccer, when we go play a soccer, I see the women on the other side doing their own thing, and that thing is dance group, dance classes. <laughs> is a good way for women to get their physical activity. You enjoy Well, that Zumba thing. is good. Exactly. I love so Zumba also, class. I love my matter. Zumba. Exactly. And I'm sure by the time you finish that, you're sweating, you know, the body is pumping, you're rejuvenated. So, you know, it doesn't have to be soccer. Um, there are so many ways that, you know, anybody can, you know, form a special physical activity group. Even you can create your own game that gets your physical activity going. Um, you come in, you you know, you talk, you start your activities, you're finished, you go home. Those are the things that I can recommend for women who are watching this show. All right, so they don't come for me, right? We're right. not going to form soccer, but we can do our dance group. There's exactly. so much more. We can make it our own, right? Exactly. Alcohol is something that I want us to talk about because a lot of time we see so much of it in our community, you know, sometimes there is that binge drinking, you know, because we think we're living the life, we're having a good time. But, you know, over time can become a problem, right? I'm not saying you cannot enjoy a glass of wine here and there. Alcohol, too much intake of it can contribute to developing hypertension. So what would you say to our friends, our community, when we go to enjoy the baby shower, the graduation, the weddings, it's all right not to have all the alcohol that's there, right? It's Correct. okay. Correct. One drink daily maximum for women and two drink for men. So you want to keep it at that minimum to avoid negatively impacting your life on, on your daily basis. Avoid abusing it. This has been fun conversation. I think we've covered enough in here. Make increase awareness. Hopefully give everyone something to do. Uh, to think about when it has to do with hypertension. We want to always end things up with one or two things that you can leave the audience with that they can start today. One or two things that, if nothing else, right, changes, what would you want to leave people with regarding hypertension or high blood pressure? The most important thing I would say is, first of all, know your blood pressure status. Whatever you do, know your blood pressure status, go to your primary care provider to know your blood pressure status. If you do have high blood pressure, even if you don't have high blood pressure, um, you want to make sure you cut down on your salt intake. You want to make sure that you increase your physical activity. You want to make sure that you cut down your alcohol intake. Quit smoking if you do smoke and do not get into smoking if you don't smoke. All right, it's very, very important. And cut down on your stress level. Um, all these things combined together is going to help you live a longer life, you know, so that when you're making that money, enjoy that fruit of your labor, you're not going to face with untimely death from hypertension. As we know, and like I said earlier, the numbers of people living hypertension is alarming. And even if you fall into that number, you have things to do to get it better, to, you know, control it, to get, you know, uh, out of it. And like I said, being aware is the first step because don't be the person who will say what I don't know cannot kill me. Ah. This is a situation where what you don't know can kill you. So it's very, very important that we, all our viewers, to know, do you have high blood pressure? Because I bet you, all the people watching this, one or two person knows somebody around them who has high blood pressure. So that's also opportunity for you to check to yourself. Do you have high blood pressure? If not, share this video to all the people that you know, or even people that in your platform, in your social media platform, your family members, your aunties, you could be saving a life. 
that's where I would live. That would be it. It'd be also great if we could share information too that can improve our health, help someone else um, also live a healthy and happier life. They're increasing their awareness and they know that, you know, if you're diagnosed, you're not alone. There are things you can begin to do to improve your health. So thank you. So please, everyone, I hope you share this video once you get hold of it. Whether you have hypertension or not, I bet you you probably know someone in your group, or not even if you don't know, there's someone in your group that if you share this with, it will make a difference for them. And they can begin to find the resources that they need and access that. So that's a really nice way to close out this episode. As always, Dr. Ike, it's always a pleasure having you. You always have a unique way of sharing information that I know will stay with our viewers. Thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome, and thank you for having me. Truly appreciate it. And that's the end of our episode. Thank you, everyone, for watching. And for more information, please visit our website at sorogib.com. You can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, you name it, all the different social platforms. We're there at Sorogi Health. We also have a YouTube channel. Please share this episode. We want to hear from you what you like, what are some of the things you want us to cover in future episodes. So until we meet again, stay blessed, know that your health matters. Thank you all.